Hello, and good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you for joining us for this series of complimentary webinars. And uh, you see today's topic is um, auditor uh, measurements uh, for compliance verification uh, based on TR-53. And uh, we're going to get into that very shortly, and I'll be introducing Arnie Steinman, who will uh, be delivering the, the content. But before I do that, um, I wanted to make sure you know that you can ask questions, you can uh, type them into the dialog box, and I'll respond uh, accordingly. And then um, if you want to speak to us, you can also ask, raise your hand in the dialog box to request that. So that uh, if I see that, I'll turn on uh, your ability to, you know, I'll, I'll unmute your line so you can ask us directly. And of course, you can ask questions afterwards. And should we not have time to answer all of the questions that come in, we'll follow up later by email. Now, before we get into uh, Arnie's uh, presentation, I just wanted to share with you a, a few uh, training opportunities that are upcoming. And actually, to do that, I'm going to go to our, there it is here, our website. I know many of you have been here and, and are familiar with the website. Uh, but just to point out, for those who may not know, there's a lot of complimentary training here that you uh, may enjoy. Under this drop-down, uh, the Windows button here at the top, uh, you see there are uh, 13 different uh, segments. And they're all uh, training-related, uh, short, you know, five-minute type training segments on specific uh, very important technical topics like voltage suppression. Most people find very confusing. So this is a good place to see it. We do it with demonstration, and uh, you, I think you you find that useful. Then under the events category, the webinars that are scheduled this year that are again this is the complimentary series uh, are listed here, and under this recorded webinars button, you can go and view webinars that we have recorded in the past. So uh, please do that. There are articles uh, up here under um, the success stories. And then in July is our annual um, main event here at my office near Boston on, on Cape Ann. I'm actually looking at uh, Winkersheek Beach and Lobster Cove where the classroom is. <clears throat> And then um, the auditor certification course. Now, those of you that were on the webinar last time, I told you that this auditor certification course was going to be in April. Um, and I'm going to actually s slip to that, that page, I hope. Um, the internet has been very slow here today. Uh, anyway, this auditor course, uh, we have moved it to because of the virus, the coronavirus, and the uncertainty of it, we have moved it to October, October 12th to the 14th, uh, for safety purposes, obviously. Um, and it'll be in the same location in um, at the Spark Technology Center in uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, this description of it gives you a good insight as to what the course is about. And this picture is typical of the hands-on class exercises we get into. Now, uh, this is the agenda for the full course that you see uh, listed here. What Arnie will be covering today is one of those uh, seven bullets. This, this category right here, the TR-53 compliance verification. Um, however, he will not be covering the troubleshooting portion of it. So it's really a portion of this uh, fourth bullet that Arnie will be uh, talking about today. The other thing that's not possible to do in a webinar is the class exercises that we have listed here. Uh, there are many hours in the class devoted to actually uh, making the measurements and using the uh, instruments uh, that are not possible on a webinar. So those are not included today. 
wanted to give you a sense of uh, what we will be covering. So let me go back to the uh, slide set, and I'm going to, at this point, uh, turn it over to Arnie, and uh, as you know, you're in very capable hands. Okay, good day, everybody. This is Arnie Steinman. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is uh, the types of measurements you make to assure you're complying with your ESD control program requirements. Um, this is what your auditor will do. Uh, some of you may be auditors, some of you may be training auditors, some of you may be uh, planning to be auditors in the future. Um, and I hope this will get you started on that process. So, if we look at our outline today, um, we're going to be anything that's in white there uh, is something we're going to be talking about. Uh, we won't be talking in detail about uh, ground bonding systems. We won't be talking about seeding, but we will be talking about most of these other uh, categories. If you look on the next slide, which I'm trying to get to move. There we go. Oops. I, 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 I think I messed you up. I helped out and made it worse. All right. There we go. Okay, so uh, these are more categories you'll find in TR53. Uh, we're only going to deal with packaging and process required insulators today. Um, as you can tell, there are a lot of categories. There are a lot of things to be checked in your ESD control program. Uh, we're not going to include the troubleshooting part that's in TR53. Uh, again, we have limited time today. Uh, we can't do the same thing in an hour webinar that we would do in a, in a two or three day course. The first thing you need to do your compliance verification is obviously the measurement instruments. And you see a list here of all of the ones that are required uh, to check all of the uh, static control methods that may be in use. Now, every static control program is different. Um, not every static control program will have all of the static control methods in place. They may not be needed. Um, but if you were to have all of your static control methods in place, this is the list of, of uh, instruments that you would need. Uh, you need some instrumentation for checking your AC power lines. Uh, you need a charge plate monitor to uh, check your ionizers. Uh, you need a DC ohmmeter uh, for resistance measurements. Uh, you see all of these instruments are ones we will talk about today. Uh, and they are what you need to do a complete um, TR-53 compliance verification program. First thing you do before you even get into the area that you're going to uh, do your verification measurements in is that you have to verify your instruments. Um, each of your instruments should be taken out of its case and you should follow some procedure. Typically, the manufacturer will give you that procedure to verify that your test equipment is operating properly. Um, I can't emphasize more the check or service the battery. Um, most of the instruments you're going to be using will probably be battery operated. And uh, I would never go into a uh, verification testing process without at least 10 batteries in my service kit. Um, Typically, you find the instruments are going to use 9-volt batteries. Some may use double A's or triple A's, but make sure you have a supply of batteries with you because in the process of doing compliance verification, these instruments do eat batteries, and you will need to change them in the course of a day. So make sure you have a, a good supply uh, with you. Now, when it comes to verifying your instruments, each one of them will have some sort of verification procedure. Uh, you need to have some kind of, uh, you know, may need some kind of test facility uh, supplied by the manufacturer to verify the instrument. But this should be the first step in the process to make sure that your instruments are okay. Um, the picture you see here is of a resistance meter and the manufacturer says that if you put both of the probes on a metal plate so that they're essentially connected together, you should read about 390 ohms in this particular case. So you'd know uh, when you put those probes on that metal plate and measure the resistance, if you came into the 390 ohm range, you'd know that you were making accurate measurements with your meter. 
So once you've verified your in instruments, you're ready to go out into the work area where you're going to try and uh, do a compliance verification. Um, the first thing you're going to do is verify your AC power and grounding system wiring because this is going to be the reference for all of your measurements. So we need to verify the AC power wiring at the ESD protected workstations or elsewhere in the ESD protected area. We need to verify that you know one of the specified uh, ESD uh, grounding and bonding systems is in use. Um, and for references, we have uh, ESDA standard S6.1 and, of course, the NFPA National Electrical Code when it comes to grounding wiring. So um, this is a chart that you'll find in S2020. Um, it talks about the requirements for various grounding methods. We're only talking about the, the principal one where you use the equipment grounding conductor that's specified in, in S6.1. And the required limit is that you have less than 1.0 impedance uh, from your ground, grounding point to the electrical ground. Um, other grounding methods will have different requirements in terms of resistance, but this is the primary one that's in use. So here you see some pictures of some of the testers that you can use uh, to check your facility AC ground. Um, we certainly recommend the AC circuit tester you see in the upper picture. Uh, the tester below uh, will just test the power lines themselves and it actually provides a convenient ground point for further testing. So four tests. You're going to test your outlet functionality. You want to verify that the neutral and ground wires are not connected together at the receptacle. They should not be. You want to verify that your AC high and AC low or neutral are not reversed. You want to verify that the AC high and ground wires are not reversed. That would be very bad. And finally, you want to verify the impedance of the ground in ohms. Um, this is this is a test that the uh, meter you see in the upper picture will be able to do for you. Uh, if you don't have that meter, you'll need to do a different test. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. So here is your typical AC receptacle. You have a black hot wire, a white neutral wire, a green wire that connects to the metal chassis or ground. Um, what you want to do is connect that metal chassis ground, the AC ground point, to what we call a common point ground. This is the place on your workstation where you're going to connect all of your ground wires. And the reason for that will become obvious in a moment. So if we didn't have a particular meter, uh, one of the things we need to do is to uh, check the resistance between the common point ground and the metal chassis ground to make sure we have a good ground connection there. We've al already ver verified our green wire ground impedance, and now we need to make sure that we measure the resistance between the common point ground and the chassis ground, and that should also be in the one ohm range. as you see there. Here's an example of what a common point ground looks like. Um, you would have your one wire connected to your AC ground and the other wires will be connected back to anything that's on the workstation that needs to be grounded. Why do we want to use this common point ground? Because it makes it way easier for the auditor to make measurements on the various uh, components of the ESD control workstation and to verify that everything is properly connected. Much easier than having to crawl around on the floor to trace wires under a workbench. So we strongly recommend that as you're putting your ESD control program together, you uh, think about installing this common point ground uh, on every workstation. Not hard to do, not expensive, but it will make your life as an auditor much, much easier. So what is our common point ground about? Well, first of all, we're going to put that common point ground in a place on the workstation where we can see it easily. We're going to connect it back to our equipment AC ground or to an auxiliary ground if we're using it. 
And the first thing we're going to connect back to that common ground point is our wrist strap connector so that we can ground our people well. We're going to ground the, the ESD protective work mat. If there's an an additional work mat on the work surface, we're going to ground that as well. And if for some reason we're going to use floor mats, we're going to connect the ground from the floor mat back to that ground point. So what you see here is that the resistance of the wrist strap connector first should be less than two ohms. Okay, that's a measurement you should make from the, the ground point for the wrist strap to the common point ground, less than two ohms. And every element to be grounded at the ESD protected workstation shall be connected to the same ground point so that you don't get any kind of voltages between grounds. Uh, you have a good connector where you can see your connections and you're able to make measurements very easily to verify that the wires that you're connected are indeed working the way they should be. So how do we test these groundable points? Well, basically, you're going to use an ohmmeter. You're going to connect one end of the ohmmeter to that groundable point, whether it's your workstation ground, your wrist strap ground, and you're going to make a measurement from there back to the common point ground. And the S2020 pass value is less than two ohms. So the procedure, connect the test leads to a DC ohmmeter, connect one test lead to the personnel groundable point, connect one test lead to the AC ground reference, and the pass value shall be less than two ohms. Very easy to do. If you have that common ground, very easy to make this measurement. Don't have to crawl under the table. So now we move to our work surfaces. We want to verify that the ESD work surface is electrically bonded to our ground reference. Minimum, maximum resistances will be specified by the end user. And we're also going to make resistance measurements of shelves, drawers, or any other grounded ESD protective storage equipment. Your references as shown for ESD standards, ADV 53.1 for ESD protective workstations, S4.1 for work surfaces, and S6.1 again for grounding. Now, let's talk about the resistance test itself. Um, for any resistance where you're measuring a surface, there's a period of time called the electrification period where the actual measurement needs to settle down. Now, if the resistance is fairly low in the range less than, than 10 to the sixth ohms, the test voltage will be 10 volts and it'll take about five seconds as the general electrification period. So you wait five seconds before you record your measurement. Um, if the resistance range is more than 10 to the sixth ohms, you're going to use a test voltage of 100 volts. Now, your test instrument may have a manual switch to switch between the two, or it may do it automatically, depends on the test instrument. But if you're going to use make measurements at these higher resistances, Basically, it's going to take longer for the measurement to stabilize. So in this case, we wait until you can see the measurement has stabilized or 15 seconds, whichever is less. So you want to verify your test equipment first before you go out to make these resistance measurements. You want to look at the electrode, make sure that it's not dirty. You want to remove um, surface contamination from that electrode. I'll show you a picture of the electrode in a minute. Um, and when using liquids to clean the electrode, you need it to allow, allow it to dry before you start retesting using the, the electrode you've just cleaned. Okay, as promised, here's a picture of your uh, standard measurement electrodes. They're specified in STM 4.1, um, typically five pounds in weight, two and a half inches in diameter, and the contact is an electrically conductive rubber uh, so that you can make a uh, better contact with rough surfaces. Um, basically, the resistance between the two electrodes will be less than 10 to the third ohms. You measure them at 
10 volts on a, on a metallic surface. Um, if you put them both on a metallic surface, you should get a resistance less than 10 to the third ohms. And I think we had a picture before where you saw the resistance was 390 ohms. Um, the other measurement that's a real good thing to do is an open circuit measurement on your tester to make sure that when nothing is connected to it, and, or the and, and the electrodes are not placed on a surface that it does measure an open circuit. Very often you'll find that there's something wrong with an instrument that measures lower resistances even though there's no electrodes connected to it. So a short circuit measurement on a metal surface, an open circuit measurement, two of the things to verify the measurement instrumentation is working correctly. So when you're doing compliance verification, you are almost always doing a point to ground me measurement. It's a resistance to ground measurement. You're not measuring from point to point on the surface, but you're measuring from the surface to ground. Um, these, these measurements are used for compliance verification. They're used for troubleshooting and some more detailed analysis if needed. So what you see here is a high resistance meter, one electrode, two test leads, and in the back there, I think you can see that ground adapter plug where you're, you, you're making your connection to your AC ground. So here's the, our measurement procedure. First of all, attach the lead, a lead to the meter and the electrode. Attach a lead to the meter and the common point ground or the AC ground adapter. Place the electrode at appropriate locations on the work surface. You try to include worn or damaged areas if you can see them on the work surface. Then you apply 10 or 100 volts depending on resistance. And then record the data in the measurement after five or 15 seconds. You can see here this particular work surface measured 2.4 times 10 to the sixth ohms, which is less than the S2020 pass value of one times 10 to the ninth for each test point. Now, let me say a little bit about this pass value. S2020 specifies one times 10 to the ninth. What we have found is more convenient is to say that as long as the resistance of the work surface is less than 10 to the eighth ohms, everything is okay. No action is needed. When it starts to measure between 10 to the eighth and 10 to the ninth ohms, it's an indication of maybe the surface needs cleaning. Maybe it hasn't been cleaned in a long time and it's getting dirty or worn. Or it may be that the, the table mat itself is beginning to reach the end of its life and you need to think about it's replacing it sometime soon. So Pass value, 10 to the ninth. Concern value is probably 10 to the eighth. As long as you're under 10 to the eighth, there's really nothing to be done. Action is needed when you exceed 10 to the eighth ohms, a recommendation. Now, moving on to, to grounding people. The most common way of grounding people is wrist straps. Um, and we want to verify that the wrist, straps, wrist strap measures within a specification for both minimum and maximum resistance. Maximum resistance to protect the product, minimum res resistance to protect the wearer. And your reference there is S1.1 on wrist straps. So um, what we're generally using to check wrist straps is some kind of integrated tester that tests both the ground cord and the wrist strap together. We place the, the, the ground cord, you know, connect the ground cord and the wrist strap. We place the wrist strap on the wrist. Uh, we adjust the cuff as necessary so it's fitting snugly. And then we connect the wrist strap to the integrated tester and test per the integrated tester instructions. Usually you either have to push a button, touch a place on the meter, and there's usually either a uh, an actual meter indication or some LEDs that indicate pass and fail. The S2020 pass value should be less than 3.5 times 10 to the seventh ohms. If you're using an integrated tester, one of the things to verify is that it is set for the correct resistance value for measurements. 
The, the high, high level resistance uh, is specified in S2020 uh, of 3.5 times 10 to the seventh ohms or 35 mega ohms. Um, the low resistance level is a safety factor that most of them, uh, that most wrist straps will meet, but you really want to check that they have at least a 750K resistance uh in in the in the ground cord and wrist strap circuit usually there's a one mega ohm resistance there occasionally we find there are cords that look like ground cords but are not for wrist straps and they may not have a resistor internally so it's a really good idea to check the low the the, the low resistance measurement on the on the wrist strap as well okay another way of grounding people is footwear um, we want to uh, verify first the footwear itself, the person on the footwear. We want to make sure they meet a specified minimum maximum range. Footwear may include shoes, foot grounders, booties, heel straps, lots, lots of different ways of, of grounding people. Uh, your references are STM 9.1, SP 9.2, and 97.1 floor materials and footwear, which is actually a, a resistance measurement in combination with a person. So here you see one type of footwear tester mounted on the wall. The person tests by putting their foot, or in fact, their two feet onto the test plates on the floor and then activating the wrist strap checker with their hand. Um, you uh, wait for a pass indication. Very often, if you don't get a pass indication, the door doesn't open to the work area. So footwear testing if footwear and flooring are in use for grounding people is very important, and you really don't want people going into the, the work area unless their footwear does pass. Um, if it doesn't, you have to perform troubleshooting. In general, this involves either getting new footwear, a new footwear grounder or talking to a supervisor why your, your ESD control footwear is not passing, but important to do. So now if we're going to do footwear measurements with a meter, um, you're going to first of all, make sure that people are wearing their footwear per, per your company procedures. You're gonna have a handheld electrode. You see that's the electrode the person is holding in their hand that has the green wire connected to it. You can connect a test lead between that handheld electrode and the positive terminal of your meter. Then you're gonna connect a uh, test lead between the common terminal of the meter and the foot electrode. You see that foot electrode that's on the floor there. Then you're gonna hold the electrode in one hand and place one foot on the foot electrode. The other foot has to be up in the air. You don't want it to contact the, the electrode or the adjacent flooring. You apply 10 volts and wait five, five seconds for the meter to stabilize. If the indicated resistance is less than one times 10 to the six for the footwear, you just repeat the measurement with the other foot. Uh, if the indicated resistance is more than 10 to the six, switch the meter to 100 volts and retest and notice uh, the resistance after the meter stabilizer after 15 seconds. For each measurement, the S2020 value shall be less than one times 10 to the ninth ohms. And basically, we'd say the same thing that we said about the work surfaces, 10 to the eighth is your real pass level, 10 to the eighth to 10 to the ninth is when you start being concerned about the ESD control method and looking into either servicing it or replacing it with a, a new, new footwear in this case, or uh, something else that needs to be changed. So our flooring systems, um, the flooring system alone, you wanna make sure is within your minimum maximum resistance range. Your ESD floor may be a permanently installed floor. It may be a floor mats. Uh, it may be a floor with an ESD floor finish, a coating or paint on it. Um, your reference again is an ESD standard S7.1. Um, and we're not gonna go into these measurements in detail because they're exactly the same as the work surface measurements. You have a meter, you have one electrode, you connect the meter to ground, you connect the electrode to the meter, and then you measure from the floor to your AC ground. Um, in fact, when you're making measurements in your work area, 
you may find it very convenient to set up your meter, make a measurement on the, on the, on the work surface, and then transfer the electrode to the floor and make a, a flooring measurement in the same area. You, you, not, you don't have to change your setup, you just have to change the location of your measurement electrode. Okay, let's move on to air ionizers now. Uh, air ionizers are there primarily to control charge on insulators and isolated conductors. Um, and basically, every use of an ionizer will have a user-specified discharge time and an offset voltage or, or ionizer balance. Um, you'll be following the, uh, the procedures in SP 3.3, again, an, an ESD association standard, uh, which gives you the test procedures for room ionization systems, flow hood ionizers, work surfaces and automated equipment ionizers, which are generally bench top and overhead blowers, and then your compressed gas ionizers, which are guns or nozzles. Uh, your references here are uh, ANSI ESD that's STM 3.1 on ionization, uh, and then ANSI ESD SP 3.3, the periodic verification of air ionizers. Okay, your necessary equipment is a charge plate monitor as shown in the lower left, or some type of portable instrument that has both a field meter and a plate assembly. You need to have a timer, an integrated timer or a stopwatch, and some type of charging device to charge the plate on your handheld meter. Or again, you can use the complete charge plate monitor, which includes all of these features. So the first measurement you're gonna make is of the discharge time or decay time of the ionizer. You place the charge plate approximately 12 inches downstream facing the ionizer or where your product is processed. That's actually the more important location. Wherever your product is being processed, record that location for future verification and always go back to that place to monitor the ionizer in this area. <clears throat> You want to momentarily ground the plate of your measuring instrument and verify zero volts DC on the plate. Then you're gonna charge that test plate to over a thousand volts DC. And then when the charge decays to a thousand volts, you're gonna start your timer. Your timer is gonna run until the charge plate voltage reaches hundred volts. So you're making a measurement from a thousand volts to hundred volts. And you wanna verify that the time to reach hundred volts meets the user specification might be 10 seconds, might be 20 seconds, might be as much as 60 seconds for some ionizer applications. But whatever your specification is, you're going to make a measurement that uh, verifies that you're, you're in the required measurement range. Um, what you see in the picture, you have the ionizer on the left, you have the handheld instrument on the right, and in between what you see there is the timer that is going to turn on and off at a thousand and a hundred volts. Once you have done the measurement for one polarity, you do have to repeat it for the other polarity because there's no guarantee that your ionizer is working for both polarities. You have to check every ionizer for its neutralization or discharge time for both polarities. The setup for making your offset or voltage balance measurements is very similar. Um, the difference here is only that you don't have the timer, same instrument. Again, you place the isolated plate assembly 12 inches downstream facing the ionizer or where the product is processed. Remember that location. You're gonna record that location for future verification so that you make measurements in the same place, which is the critical part of your process. You're gonna momentarily, momentarily ground the plate of the instrument and verify that it reads zero volts. Then holding it in front of the ionizer, as shown, you're gonna wait a manufacturer specified time. Depends on the ionizer, but typically it's one to five minutes. And then you're going to verify that the offset voltage meets the user specification. Now, S2020 specifies that the pass value shall be less than 35 volts at each test point. And that's what you're going to be looking for in this measurement of your ionizer offset voltage that it remains below 35 volts. Now, mobile equipment. OK, 
could be carts, can be shelves. Um, you want to make sure that you have a ground path wherever you're going to place sensitive equipment. You want to verify that your specified resistance to ground of mobile equipment through the ground of the floor is within the proper range. And you're going to test the mobile equipment with the same testing procedure that we used in the work surfaces section. You have a ground cord connected to your AC ground. You have an electrode connected to the meter. Um, your references as 6.1 for grounding, uh, again, 53.1 for protective workstations, and as 4.1 for work surfaces. You have a picture here. You see your mobile cart. You see your one electrode on the shelf of the cart. Um, and your meter that's connected to AC ground. So place the mobile equipment on your grounded ESD protective floor because that's what is going to be providing the grounding. Do not clean the ESD floor immediately prior to verification. You want a real test here, real life. You want to remove all the sensitive items from the mobile equipment just to, as a precaution because your electrode is going to be putting voltage on the, uh, on the cart. And then you're going to connect the ground adapter to your AC electrical outlet and connect the wire from the meter to that ground adapter and a wire from the meter to the test electrode. You're going to position first the electrode on the top shelf of a cart and apply the 10 or 100 volt test voltage depending upon the resistance. The S2020 pass value shall be again less than 1 times 10 to the 9th ohms for each test point. Now, a few cautions about the cart. Um, first measurement you make on the top shelf, second measurement you make on the next shelf, third measurement you make on the next shelf. You do have to measure every shelf because there's no guarantee they're all connected together. Um, metal carts um, have for years used a, um, an insulator between the, the posts of the cart and the shells. And that doesn't, you know, give you a ground connection. So there are simple ways to deal with that, but they must be dealt with. Um, another thing in this picture, you see the wheels of the cart. You also see a drag chain in the picture. Drag chains are notoriously ineffective and unreliable. Carts would be better served by having two conductive or dissipative casters on the cart itself rather than depending upon a drag chain. Um, you may wind up doing troubleshooting when you have drag chains because you won't be able to get your 10th to the 9th ohms pass on, on each measurement. But it's something to think about uh, when you do your auditing, whether you need to recommend that carts and other mobile equipment should have grounding casters rather than depending upon drag chains. So moving on now to packaging. Um, Packaging is very important for protecting our products as it moves around in our work area and as we send it out of our work area. Uh, you want to verify either the surface or volume resistance of the ESD protected packaging. Um, they may be waffle packs, bags, totes, bins, storage boxes, trays, cushion wrap, lots and lots of different packaging materials that we use to protect our products during transport within our protected area or shipping to our customers. Um, we want to verify the ESD protective packaging, particularly because some of the ESD control properties deteriorate with time and use. So we want to be careful when we're using protective packaging that it hasn't been sitting in our stock room for too long, so long that the, the, the static control properties are no longer there. Our references for packaging testing are S541, the packaging material standard, S8.1 symbols because packaging needs to be marked, and STM 11.11 .11 or 11.12 or 11.13, depending upon what type of packaging you're going to be using. So let's look at uh, first some of the surface resistance setups. setups. Um, you see a meter on top. Um, it has two electrodes on the back. You place it on the surface, your measurement, and you do make a measurement of the resistance between those two electrodes. Um, another method is to use a concentric ring electrode. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, where you have two electrodes in that concentric ring. You connect them to the meter. 
um, and you make your measurement. You can see here that when you're making these packaging measurements, they need to be made on an in, on an insulative support surface, so that's your 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 surface is not affecting your measurement. Some other test setups here: um, a two-point probe is very often used for measuring small areas and irregular areas, um, and when you have large um, surfaces like a, uh, a ESD protective carton, for instance, cardboard, um, you can use the five pound test probes, they will work as well. So here's a picture of our uh, concentric ring assembly. Um, it's described in STM 1111. It consists of two concentric rings. The inner rings is a, is a solid disc, and the outer, outer ring, outer electrode is, is, is actually a ring. And once again, these things should weigh at least five pounds to get the proper pressure on the surface. Um, one of the problems we have, if you remember that first meter we looked at on the top here is that very often this checker does not have a five pound weight and sometimes it makes inaccurate measurements. The, the uh, standards all specify that the measurement electrodes should be a five pound weight unless you're using a two point probe. So here's your concentric ring electrode and here's a picture of your two-point probe. You see you have two probes, they have the conductive rubber on the end, um, and um, they're spring-loaded so that basically you, when you push down on them, you are putting a metered pressure onto the ends of the uh, two-point probe electrodes. As you can see, they're very good when you have to make measurements in small pockets of, of a tray, for instance. So here's the, the scheme for our doing our resistance test. We place the package on an insulated support surface. We place the test electrodes of the integrated checker or meter near the center of the package or on worn areas if there are any. Or we place the concentric ring near the center of the package or on worn areas. Or we use our two-point test electrode near the center of the package or on worn areas. Um, you can place that two-point test probe into recessed areas as needed. We apply our 10 or 100 volt test voltage. We wait for the reading to stabilize. And the one caveat we always make is that when you're testing bags that you're putting product in, you wanna test both the inside and the outside surfaces of the bag. Now your pass resistance is specified in S5 S541. There may be some user specified requirements. The general test for packaging is that it has to be less than 10 to the 11th ohms resistance, the surface resistance. So that's what you're looking for. Um, when you get above 10 to the 10th ohms, you start to be concerned about the packaging material reaching the end of its lifespan. So um, while the pass requirement is 10 to the 11th ohms, um, we really start to be concerned when we get to 10 to the 10th ohms. So, finally, we get to process required insulators. Um, why are there process required insulators? Because they may be necessary to your manufacturing, but in general, the, the process required insulator we are most concerned about is the product itself. Um, think about your product. Does it have any insulators in it? Most likely it does, and these are the ones we're most concerned about. We can't eliminate them, but we need to control the charge on them. And when we talked about non-essential insulators, S2020 is very clear that non-essential non insulators should just be removed from the process environment. But what do we do about our required insulators? Well, we need to make some charge measurements on them. The instruments we use are either an electrostatic field meter. This is an example of one of them. We might also use a, an electrostatic voltmeter. What's the difference? Well, the difference is generally that a electrostatic field meter has a uh, distance to viewing area ratio of about four to one. 
But since the field meter makes measurements and is calibrated at one inch, that means that you, when you look with an electric field meter at a surface, you're really looking at a four inch diameter circle on that surface. So basically what you're looking at is a fairly large area. The electrostatic field meter, a voltmeter on the other hand, um, is usually able to measure at much smaller distances. It may have the same ratio between distance and uh, measurement view, but a, an instrument like this can measure down at one-tenth of an inch so that you're actually looking at an area less than a half an inch in diameter. So you'd use an electrostatic voltmeter. You could use it to measure large surfaces, but it's particularly helpful when you're measuring very small surfaces. So you're going to be looking for the charge on your isolated conductors with either of these two instruments. So our measurement process here, first of all, turn it on, activate the on button of the field meter or voltmeter, ground the meter, make sure there's a ground connection for it. With field meters, the ground connection may be through the user's hand if the user is grounded, or you may have a ground wire on it. An AC, a, 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 a electrostatic voltmeter, always requires a ground connection. And I think I mentioned before that the ground connections that are available, some of them have a one meg resistor to be used with a wrist strap. The same ground cord will work with a, a, an electrostatic voltmeter, but the meter will not operate correctly if the ground cord has a one meg resistor in it. So the ground cords that come with an electrostatic voltmeter have no resistor in them. They're just a direct connection to ground. Um, getting those confused with a wrist strap connector can have serious consequence, consequences for safety. So it really would be a, a, a good idea to It really would be a good idea to make sure that any ground cord that doesn't have a resistor in it is marked very clearly and used only with something like the electrostatic voltmeter. So we're going to ground the meter, we're going to zero the meter, make sure it reads zero when it's looking at ground, and then we're going to position our meter the specified distance from an object. It might be one inch for a, a field meter. It might be a tenth of an inch for an electrostatic voltmeter. We want to allow the meter to, to stabilize, and the reading may be in volts per inch or volts. We want to record that meter reading. Now, here are the S2020 values, and we're going to talk very briefly about what they mean. S2020 specifies. For any object that is less than 1.25 inches to the, well, for any object that is 1.25 inches to the ESDS item, to our sensitive item, but less than 12 inches, so it's the ESDS item is more than 1.25 inches from our essential insulator and less than 12 inches. Okay, S2020 says you can allow up to 2,000 volts on the object. That's greater than 1.25 inches from the uh, sensitive object. Now, first of all, if the sensitive object is the product itself, the distance is always zero. So basically, this doesn't apply. What, is, what does S2020 say about distances less than 1.25 inches? Well, it says that the pass value shall be less than 125 volts for each object. So if it's your ESDS item and its CDM value is more than, say, 200 volts, then 125 volts on the object is probably going to be okay. Um, but if your CDM rating is lower than 125 volts, you need to make this pass value even lower. Now, what's the problem with this? If you look at this carefully, I can have 1.25 volts at 1.25 inches. That's okay. I can have 
Arnie, one, don't you mean don't you mean uh, two thousand volts? No, well, I'm going to get to the two thousand volts. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, one point two five volts at one point two five inches is okay. That's clear. However, the first statement says that if I had two thousand volts at one point five inches, that would also be okay. Does not compute. If something is sensitive to 125 volts at 1.25 inches, certainly it's going to be hazardous to have 2,000 volts at 1.5 inches. And that's what this, this particular specification in S2020 leaves in doubt. Um, it's very clear that if you have more than 2,000 volts on an object, keep it more than 12 inches away. And in fact, what we generally recommend is that any object that can charge to any value be kept more than 12 inches away from the sensitive product, unless of course it's the sensitive product itself, in which case you may have to make sure that the voltage on the sensitive product is lower than its CDM rating by at least a factor of two, if not more. Ted, does that clear things up or did you wanna jump in there yeah. with some other No, that's, that's, that's fine, thanks, that's great, yep. Okay. So finally, after doing all of these checks and knowing about how to make the measurements, um, what we need to think about is how often do we make these measurements? So remember that the compliance verification objective is to identify significant changes in the ESD equipment and materials performance over time. So you'd really like to be doing your compliance verification before there's a problem with something. So basically, you're going to set your test frequencies based on how critical are the ESD sensitive items. Um, if your items are not sensitive below 500 volts, you're probably not going to test your, your compl for compliance verification that often. However, if they're very critical and they have, they're very sensitive to ESD, ESD um, you're going to want to set your fre test frequency more often to make sure that your ESD protective materials never go out of failure. You cannot risk failure for your ESD protective equipment and materials if your ESD sensitive items are of very critical nature. If you're doing aerospace, you're doing military applications, um, these are things, these are ESD sensitive items that you want zero failures in. So you want to protect them as best you can. And, you know, that will result in checking for compliance verification more frequently. So here are some things to, to, cons to, to consider when you're setting test frequency. Your daily wrist strap checks. Do people check their wrist straps every day? If they do, it's probably not necessary to check them again. Um, if you have constant wrist strap monitoring, if you have constant monitors for your wrist strap monitoring, these will be there to assure grounding reliability. Again, you don't have to check because your constant monitors are checking for you. Uh, your packaging checks will depend on the composition of the packaging and its use. Some packaging will lose ESD properties over time. Some packaging is humidity dependent. Some packaging has a limited shelf life. Uh, and some materials, such as ESD floor finishes, may require more frequent monitoring because of their lack of permanency. They're not supposed to be permanent. Um, some materials, such as ESD vinyl floor covering, may require less monitoring because they're not likely to change over time. Um, the general procedure here to use is to start off with a fairly quick, uh, you know, uh, compliance verification testing, perhaps one month after you install your ESD control item. Check it at one month. If it's within spec, do nothing. Come back a month later, check it again. If it's still within spec, do nothing. You come back at the third month, it's out of spec. It's a table mat. You clean the table, you have someone clean the table mat. You recheck it, it's now within spec. Now you know that you need to check your table mats not every three months, but rather every two months. Same thing is true with ionizers, same thing is true with many things. 
just check on a monthly basis until you have established the time until you need to actually do some maintenance on the ESD control item. Um, at that point, you've established what your, uh, what your test frequency needs to be. It may not be the same for all items. There's no harm in testing things more often. It just takes up time. Um, one other thing to, to consider also, as a TR-53 auditor, where does your responsibility stop? In other words, you're out there to do a compliance verification measurement. Are you out there to troubleshoot if it doesn't pass? Maybe, maybe not. Are you there to repair the ESD control method if it fails? Actually, probably not. It probably would be not, not your job to fix a broken wire or an ungrounded table mat. That's probably a facilities issue that you're going to pass on. But for every, for every uh, company, your responsibilities will be different. So in some cases, you may find that one of your responsibilities will be to do troubleshooting and identify the problem that might be fixed by facilities. Or in some cases, it may be your responsibility to go and get whatever it takes to fix the problem and then retest it to assure that the problem has been fixed. And just okay. as a reminder, uh, visit our website for the other uh, opportunities for complimentary training. And uh, hopefully we'll see you here in July or in, uh, so I'll get to fix that one, uh, in, or in October. July is the main uh, event here. It's a four day workshop. And uh, the October one, which is right there, there in this slide, it says April. Uh, is the auditor certification program. So our conclusions here, uh, auditing is going to be essential to the success of any ESD control program. You can't just put things in and forget about them. You do have to go back and check them periodically. <clears throat> the TR-53 compliance verification standard is synchronized with the requirements for ANSI ESDS 2020. The measurements that are specified in this document will meet all the requirements of S2020. Uh, all elements of your ESD control program will need to be periodically checked to verify compliance with your facility requirements. Um, you may not use everything that's in TR-53. You may not use seating as part of your ESD control program. You may not use garments as part of your ESD control program. But whatever is written into your ESD control program will need to be periodically checked as part of your ESD control program working. Uh, for failing a compliance verification test requires troubleshooting. It requires corrective action. The troubleshooting part of it is actually contained in TR-53. Uh, in our longer uh, auditor certification course, you will get all that troubleshooting information, but it almost always also requires corrective action of some kind. Troubleshooting may be the auditor's uh, uh, job in the, in the auditor's job description. Corrective action is probably not. Someone else will have to it have to correct the problems. The auditor's job will be to basically to flag the problem and make sure that something is going to be done about it. And also to make sure that the, the area where the compliance verification test failed is adequately marked so people don't continue working in that area until the corrective action has been taken. So thank you very much for your attention today. Um, we hope we've interested you in the compliance verification program. And certainly we hope to see you uh, in our certification course where you'll get much more information and a lot of hands-on uh, you know, operations with the test equipment. Um, we're here as long as you need to ask questions. Ted, do you, have you been monitoring questions? I have, thanks. And uh, I have uh, two people that may want to ask a verbal question. Let me just turn on the one mic at a time. Uh, Mark, you had a question mark next to your name. Did you want to ask one? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, so well, I mean, just in general, if you are using ionizers, you do want to watch to see if they build up white deposits on the tips, uh, fuzz or whatever you want to call it. 
it's mm-hmm. a it'll throw the ionizers out of balance more affect the decay times it's an indicator you have junk in the air that probably shouldn't be in the air. and if you do sem edx analysis to see what's present it tells you what garbage you have in the air which also affects the ionizers makes nanoparticles can shed millimeter dendrites that land on a mask print thousands of bad circuits could affect disk drives mm-hmm. and it is worth analyzing the tips if you have sure. issues and too uh, frequent cleaning requirements. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely mm-hmm. true. Um, you know, when when you're looking at ionizers, um, you, the first test you're going to do is you know, obviously your offset and balance and and discharge time tests. Um, if things pass. You really don't have to do anything, but it's also a good time to take a look at those emitter points and see if they need cleaning. Uh, the cleaning process for most ionizers is fairly quick. A minute or two is all it takes to, to clean whatever deposits have built up on the emitter points. Um, and the deposits, the speed at which they build up will depend upon, as you said, what's in the air. Um, if places don't have a lot of chemicals in the air, it's not going to happen very quickly. Um, if you have a lot of chemicals in the air, you may need to clean those emitter points as often as every two weeks. Or, so, uh, or more, in which case you have some leak or something that you should be addressing. Right. And exactly. that emitter points are actually mapping your factory to tell you where you have anomalous. Exactly. They, the they are one of the most sensitive indicators of chemicals in the air. But again, you have to look at the emitter points, you have to measure the ionizer performance, and over a period of time, establish what your auditing uh, frequency needs to be. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Mark. Uh, let me go see. Uh, let me go look at, for another one here. Uh, Jay, you had a question, uh, Mark, on your, near your name. Do you have one to add? Jay Skolnick. Hmm? Oh, Jay. yes. Yeah, that's me. Ted, how are okay. you? I'm well, and yourself? Good to have uh, you with us. Great. No, it was great information. Um, I know you, you have the TR-53 certification. Yeah. Um, yes. Is that, um, if we if we take that and we get certified, is that recognized through the ESDA? No, it is not at this time. It is, uh, it's uh, just through my company, and we cover more material than is currently part of uh, the TR-53 program. The okay. association uh, offers. We include the charge device model, charge board event, uh, that sort of material. So it, it goes okay. beyond the scope. And how often do you have these classes? Well, we have them, you know, a few times a year. Um, sometimes at customer sites, and sometimes this one that I'm uh, just announced today in October would have been. Uh, it would it would have been. The, the, in April, if the virus weren't uh, present. Okay. Okay. So if I have a bunch of people, we can just call you about maybe doing it on site or coming to one of your seminars. Yeah, a lot of clients like to have it done on site for uh, some obvious reasons. They can then also walk out on the floor and uh, do the same kind of work. Okay. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I had a whoops. I went too far. Let me go down a little further here. There was one more at the end. Uh, okay. I've got I got one more on the line here. I can't, it's hard to read the name here. Michelle. Hello. Maybe not. Okay, I think that covers it, Arnie. Let me just do one more scan. Oh, here's one. Hold on. Uh, Ricardo, how are you? Ricardo, your mic should be on at this point. You may be muted on your, your end as well. Down the list. Whoops, I keep getting off the screen here. I think we've got it, Arnie. Okay. 
Well, thank you everybody for attending today. Um, and uh, if questions occur to you um, after after we sign off, please please feel free to send them to us. You can send it to arnie at danglemeyer.com or to ted at danglemeyer.com. And we would be happy to answer your questions uh, in a timely fashion. So yes. have a good rest of the day. Yep. And thank you all for and joining we'll, us. We'll and hope we'll to see you at the workshop or the TR53 training. Or the next uh, complimentary webinar. Right. Thank, thank you.